right, First Chronicles chapter 12, 30. Thank you. Thank you very much. First Chronicles 12, 32. Um, this evening I come pregnant with a thought that I would like to share with you. As we're coming into 2024, there were four things God told me, four of them. Um, I'll just share one of them with us tonight. That's the one I feel impressed to share with you tonight. First Chronicles chapter 12 and verses 32. The Bible says, And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200. And I want us to read the last part of that verse together. One, two, let's go. And all their brethren were at their command. You know, another way to put it is that all their brethren were submitted to their leadership. So because they understood the times. Now, if you read the old chapter, you discover that the tribe of Issachar were practically the smallest tribe in Israel at that time. But they had an advantage. The Bible says they understood the times and they knew what Israel ought to do. The person who knows the way leads everybody else. They understood the times and knew what Israel ought to do. Because of that, the Bible says all their brethren, not some, all their brethren were at their commandment or command or at their leadership. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Hebrews 11 verse 1. As we began to go into 2024, one of the things God began to speak very loudly to my heart is that 2024 is going to be a year for the saints to walk by faith. Hebrews 11 one says, Now faith is. I want us to read it together. One, two, let's go. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. What? The evidence of things not seen. Now I want us to read or shout the first word together. One, two, let's go. No. Say it again. No. Say it again. No. Say it again. No. Say it again. No. Now there are debates around this verse. Some people say that the reason why the writer of Hebrews 11 or the writer of Hebrews, some believe it's Paul, some say it's not Paul, where whoever wrote it, God inspired it. That's the important thing. Some people believe that that word, now, that was used in starting that verse was used as a means of either English or semantics or, you know, because he was already saying something in chapter 10, so he just came to verse 11, verse 1, and says now. But you see, I believe very strongly that that first word captures the very essence of faith. Somebody shout again now. now. All right, you may please take your seats this evening. Now. Now. Now, there are two things you must understand. Two things you must understand when God speaks. The very first thing is to understand that God's voice is a revelation of divine timing. God's voice is a revelation of divine timing. Now, in the book of Acts chapter 1, verses 6, Acts 1, 6. Now, very powerful book of the Bible. The Bible begins by saying, in Acts 1, 6, the writer says, When they therefore were come together, talking about the disciples, he says, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And then quoting what Jesus responded to the disciples when they asked this question. Verse 7. He says, Jesus said, he said unto them, It is not of you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own power. Now, when you read this, you see two words there. Times and seasons. Now again, a lot of times I do not like going into Greek, Hebrew, and all of those things, but sometimes they are extremely necessary to help us understand what the writers of the Bible were trying to communicate as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, a large chunk of the Old Testament, about 99.9% .9 of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. So they wrote it in Hebrew. God inspired them. They wrote it in Hebrew. 
sometimes some things that God said, they felt, hmm, this thing is too big. So they, they might have just tried to water it down a little bit, some parts of it. And I have some verses to quote, Psalms 8 and the rest. But a very minute part is written in Aramic. Yeah, some parts of Ezra, some parts of Daniel, because it was Aramic, they were speaking in the Babylonian Empire. But the whole of the New Testament, beginning to the end, Matthew 1, verse 1, to the end, Revelations 21, is entirely written in Greek. Now, when the writer of Acts, which was Dr. Luke, was communicating this, he said, according to what Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. It's very easy to think that Jesus was saying the same thing when he said times and seasons. But you see, when you go to the Greek words, the first word there is chronos, times, and the second is kairos, season. Now, I'll explain what that means very quickly. Chronos means chronological time. Like, if you look at the time now, the time in Nigeria is seven something, right? That's chronos, chronological time. Jesus was saying, it is not for you to know the chronological time. And then the second part, seasons. Now, that's Kairos. And what Kairos speaks about is divine timing. That means something that God has ordained he wants to do in, for example, in two years, in three years, in seven years. For example, in one year. So when Joseph looked at Pharaoh and said, you know, seven years there will be famine, and then there will be seven years of abundance, rather, and seven years of famine, that was Kronos, Kairos. Seasons. Now, when God speaks, now every day, every part of Kronos is, God has said it in his word, we are going to experience overflow. But you see, when God inspires his servant to say that in 2024, this Kairos, 2024, we're going to experience the overflow. God is announcing what he has set for this particular time. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So it means that even though God has said it consistently in his word, there is a grace, a special grace apportioned to 2024 for his children to walk in what is called the overflow. So if you've walked in overflow before, you've not seen anything yet because there is a grace available. When God's servant declared that this year, according to God's inspiration and word to him, that the household of David will walk in not an overflow, not an overflow, but the overflow. It means that this year will surpass anything you've ever seen before where overflow is concerned. Do you understand what I'm saying now? You see, the very first time I ever met pastor, very first time I ever saw him, I heard a lot about him before I saw him, right? And both from men and from God, okay? <laughs> and the very first time I can remember vividly, it was a service in a particular fellowship in the University of Ibadan. I walked into service, he was wearing a navy blue trouser and a sky blue shirt, and it was a Wednesday service, yes, Wednesday service, and he was standing behind the altar and he was preaching, and one of the two first sentences he said, was that he says the best of God can never be in the past. Very first time I saw him. The best of God can never be where? So if you've seen overflow, get ready for what God is about to do in 2024. When God's voice comes, it comes communicating to us divine timing. That's the first thing you must understand. The second thing you must understand is that prophecies need the cooperation of man. For them to materialize. Prophecies need what? The cooperation of man for them to materialize. First Timothy chapter 8, verse chapter 1, rather, verses 18. First Timothy 1 18. The Bible says, and this is Paul speaking to his mentee, his prodigy, someone who is raised, Timothy, who remember at this time Timothy was the pastor of the church of Ephesus. From historical data, they say Timothy at this time, he was a young man. And that's why if you read the book of Timothy at some point, Paul will tell Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. Why? Because he was a young man. He was who they would call a youth. He was in his 20s. 
And he was pastoring a church that was about 80,000 people strong. So Paul looked at him and hear what Paul told him. He says, I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by, the, by them mightest do what? War a good warfare. Prophecies do not come to pass by themselves. You must understand that when God speaks, and you must be able to decipher by the Spirit when what God is saying is a sovereign statement or a conditional statement. Even though 2024, God has said, see, this is the year of the overflow for you as the household of David, and there is, uh, uh, there is grace, unique grace. You know, grace is in dimensions, and let me not go into grace. So there is grace, right? To do certain things, to open certain doors, to push God's people into certain experiences. It is prophetic in nature, but you see, it needs the cooperation of every one of us for that prophecy to come to pass in our lives. So he's telling him that when a prophecy goes forth, the next thing to do, as the said, is to war a good warfare with that prophecy. How? Go to verse 19. He begins to tell you how. He says, holding faith. This is how you war. Remember, in, I think later on in the, in the book of Timothy, Paul begins to talk about fight the good fight of faith, isn't it? He says, holding faith and a good conscience, which some haven't put away concerning faith, has made a shipwreck. Holding faith. This is how we war with prophecies. So when prophecy comes, you grab it. You take it. You personalize and internalize it. And then you begin to do something, which I really want to dwell on tonight as inspired by God's Spirit. 2 Kings chapter 7. In 2 Kings chapter 7, we read a very beautiful story about how saints should war with prophecy, how, what it means to hold faith. The Bible says that then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow, now there was famine in Israel, remember that, he says, tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Can you give us this in the Amplified? I think it helps to explain. You know, when you're hearing shekel, 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 you're wondering, what is shekel? You know. <laughs> now, in the Amplified, it says, okay, it goes back to shekel. Okay, Amplified is shekel. So let's just stick with the shekels people. Now, right? It's like saying that how much is a bag of rice in Nigeria at the moment? 50 something? It's 55, there about. It's like saying, about this time tomorrow, a bag of rice shall be sold for one naira. Oh. <laughs> Daddy, do you, I did, do you understand what Elijah was, Elisha was saying here? Now, when he said it, now, verse 2. <laughs> The Bible says, the Lord on whose hand the king leaned. Now, you must understand. You see, I usually say this. There are no meaningless details in the Bible. Now, this guy, you know, the most, sometimes the very powerful people that you must never ignore are the people who stand in the corridor of power. You know, there is a book that God is inspiring me to write in the corridors of power. Because sometimes you ignore the gate man at the gate. Ignore the secretary and you want to go and see Oga. Not knowing that uh, when you go, those people are the ones that tell Oga, Oga, hmm, useless man. <laughs> and Oga makes a decision. I mean, if you study leadership, you discover that a lot of times, it is not necessarily the leader that is bad. Sometimes, it are the people that the leader might have surrounded himself or herself with. Because he spent, he or she spent more time with those people, listens to their perspective. They can color judgment. So this guy was a guy that was always with the king. So he was hearing daily reports as they were giving economic reports to the king. That, <laughs> king, uh, if you know what Bali is saying in town now, he was hearing everything. So he was speaking from an informed place. The Bible says, the man on whose hand, the king leaned, answered the man of God. He said, 
based on everything I know. Behold, if the Lord would make even windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, this is Elisha speaking to him. Now he says, ah, you will see it with your eyes, but you will not eat thereof. This man should have gone to beg, but he didn't beg. He felt, hey, what is he saying? Now, verse 3. Now, immediately prophecy went forth. Now, hear what began to happen. And there were four leprous men. These people had always been at the entering of the gates. But they never thought of making any move until a prophecy went forth. The Bible says, and they said one to another for the first time. Now, in Israel, when you're leprous, they push you out of town because according to the law, I mean, you will contaminate the rest of us. So just stay out there. So only God knows how long these people had been at the gate of Samaria. But immediately prophecy went forth. This is God's part. God, and I think pastor shared extensively on that toward the end of 2023. God will just begin to place thoughts in the hearts of people, right? And then God just placed the thoughts there. For the first time in all the years they've been sitting at the gate, they said, hey, you know what? Wait, oh, why are we sitting here until we die? <laughs> Verse 4, and they said, if we enter into the city, there is famine in the city. We shall die there. And if we sit still here, we would also die. Say, now therefore, come, let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. The Syrians had come to fight the people of Samaria. So they were camped outside the gate. Now, man, God is... Now, let, let, let me continue reading. Let me, Joshua, calm down, calm down. So it says, Now therefore come, let us fall on to the host of the Syrians, if they shall save us alive, and we shall live, and they will not kill us, and we, we shall not die. At least they will give us something to eat. Verse 5. Verse 5 says, And they rose up in the morning. Somebody say they rose up. Somebody say it again. They rose up in the, in the twilight. That was very early in the morning before the sun came up. To go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of the Syrians, behold, there was no man there. Verse 6. <laughs> Note that part. There was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise. Ah. <sighs> A noise of chariots and a noise of horses. How many men were coming toward the Syrians again? Talk to me, saints. Four. Not just four men. Four leprous men. In the north, they call them Kuturu. Because they are struggling to walk. Do you understand what I'm saying? These were leprous men. So they were not walking properly, saints. They, were not, they couldn't march. These were leprous men. You could hardly even hear them move if you were standing beside them. But the Bible says, the Lord had made the Syria. He amplified their steps. The Bible says, and they want to another. Lord, the king of Israel has hired against us the high king of the Hittites and the king of the Egyptians to come upon us. Verse 7. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents. They left their horses, left their horses. I mean, you would think that any normal person that wants to run would jump on a horse. They would know enough to jump on a horse and move. But they left the horse because the fear was so great that they believed that if they run, they will run faster than any horse. So they left the horse, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. Verse 8. And when the lep these lepers came to the utmost part of the camp, they went one tent to do another. They ate, they drank. They carried silver, gold, raiment, and they went and hid it. Now, this is the interesting thing. Who goes to battle with silver, gold, raiment? All of, who goes to battle with those things? I, I, do you understand what I'm saying? Who goes to battle with these things? But you see, the all-knowing God, who has seen 2024, began to organize in 2023. Some people are buying houses now, they are buying it for you and me. Some people are buying cars, they are buying it for you and me. Some people possessed the land many years ago. Unknown to them, they were possessing the land. They were just trustees holding it for you and me. 
they were, they were going to battle. They took silver, gold, took everything. When they got to the battlefield, <laughs> they took food. They fled, left everything. And these four leprous men came in. Now, I have a question. It was God's responsibility to bring the thoughts to the heart of the lepers. But what about if the lepers never rose? What was God going to amplify? If the lepers never took a step, what was God going to amplify? Answer me. Nothing. It will remain a thought. The prophecy would have gone forth. But nothing would happen. Would it be because God did not prophesy? No. It will be because God's saints never acted. Saints, I want you to say the first word in the Hebrews 11 one again. Say now. You see, the title of this message is the now mentality. I believe very strongly that 2024 is the year to take action. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. It is a year of action. And you take action when? Don't wait to take action when? Now! There are things God has told you. There are thoughts God is going to be dropping in your heart. Take action when? Now! Why? Because the character of faith is that you believe and you act. Ah! You believe and you do what? You act. Even when you are not sure that the Syrians are there. But the word of God has gone forth. So you act anyway. Why? You act because God has said it. Someone said it this way. The proof of desire is pursuit. If you are not doing anything, I can assure you, you do not believe the word of God. The proof that you believe God's word is not only to hear it and settle it in your heart, but you must settle it in your heart to the point that it gets you to act. The book of Acts was written because the apostles acted. If the apostles never acted, the book of Acts would not be written. We will not be reading anything about the book of Acts. A lot of times, we are waiting for God. Meanwhile, God is waiting for us. The promises of God to us are huge, but action in 2024 is what would birth results. Action. Somebody say action. So James began to meditate about what I've just told you, and he got to a point, James chapter 2, verse 17, and he said, ah, he says, faith without works is dead. Being alone. That means faith is not complete without works. A version of the Bible says it this way. It says faith without corresponding action. Do you know what corresponding action is? Action that shows that you have faith. Faith without corresponding action is dead. We produce no results. Because what you must understand is that results are not accidental. Results are orchestrated. Action. Somebody say action. Your action is the resource in the hands of God that he would work with to bring overflow into our experience in 2024. Now, let me quickly tell you before I close, just some few minutes more. Four causes of inaction. Okay, five. F quickly. Why is it that people do not act? Number one, excuses. Somebody say excuses. What are excuses? Excuses are the reasons you give yourself not to act. Those reasons will seem good enough until you meet somebody else who has acted regardless. If you know, there is this very interesting song. God said it, I believe it, and God said to it, it is not true. I'm sorry to break, bust your bubble. It's not true. God said it, I believe it, and I acted on it, and that is what settles it. 
excuses must die in 2024. Now it's 10 days already. I can assure you, some of us at the beginning goes, well, we pray, I'll pray down fire this year. You've not prayed anything this year. <laughs> because you see, you must understand that in the school of faith, one of the greatest enemies is your feelings. In the school of faith, you do things regardless, not based on how you feel. I'm telling you, not based on how you feel. You do it, that is what God has said I should do. I will do it anyway. I am called a believer. Why? Because I believe. Right? And I would act. Excuses must die. Must die in 2024. You know, there is this part of the Bible. Acts chapter 10 verse 34. And I, I mean, I've been meditating on that verse because... The kinds of things that I'm believing God for in 2024, you know, at some point, I sincerely try to ask myself, Joshua, are these things really possible? And you know, God said, he's no respecter of persons. He says, but in every nation, if you go to 35, he says, in every nation, he says, he that feareth him and walketh righteousness is accepted with him. That means that God does not have spiritual favorites. People that you will say, it is only you I will bless. You see, I understand Esau and Jacob. But you see, you do not belong to Esau's clan. You must understand that, right? So you are the one that God loves. You are the beloved. So that one is settled. How far you will go is dependent on how far you are willing to go. Not God. So excuses must die in 2024. Number two, offense. You know what offense is? Holding on to wrongdoings or holding on to the past. One uncle offended you 10 years ago. Say, so, say, why are you the way? Is my parents. You see, this is what happened to me when I was young. I was abused, as painful as that is, really. But you see, your background must not be the reason why your back is on the ground. Make up your mind. There are people that have gone through wars. And when you see them, except they tell you their story, you will never believe. So let every kind of offense die. Number three, procrastination. People just put in things, I will do it later. I will do it in February. February is going to be the month. Let me play in January. <laughs> the year is going pastor said it to us. It's going to run so fast. Whatever you want to do, do it when? Now. Now. Stop procrastinating. Stop procrastinating. You know, I had this very sad story. Story, I, I saw it on one, the pastor was speaking about it, that there was this very, and brother Billy Akoni was the one who told the story, that many, some years back, he was still a very young man then, this old American preacher and his wife flew to Benue, Boko, where he, he was resided. And then they decided, they said God sent them to Nigeria and specifically sent them to Boko to come and preach. And this man was very old. He was in his 70s. So, bro, Billy Akoni said, oh, no problem. Was, did all the work. He just got to, he just got led by God to Boko at that time. So he said, no, I will sow this as a seed. I would you know, put the crusade together, invite people, do all of that. And he did. He said, so this old man got to the stage and it was time for him to begin to preach. And he would say one sentence and begin to cough. And they would give him water. He would drink. So you say, God, God loves you. He would drink, he drink. And when the message was over, he made altar call, nobody came out. And of course, the crusade had to end. And as the man was going back, you know, bro, no problems. If people didn't get saved today, maybe they will get saved another day. Maybe the seed has been sown in the earth. So he decided and told them that, sir, I will take you in the car to, you know, to, the, to, the, to your resting place where you just rest for a while. And as they entered into the car, they said this man began to cry. And bro, Bile looked at him and said, sir, why are you crying? And the man looked at him and said, bro, Bile, don't be like me. 
He said, when I was 20, God told me to go to Africa and told me to go to Nigeria and mentioned Boko that I should go there and go and preach and my ministry will be based there. But I told God that God, wait, let me get married first. That when I get married, at least I'll have a wife. We'll go together. He said, I got married at 25. He said, when I got married, God came and said, son, it's time to go. I told God, God, wait. That let's have children first. That when I give birth, I will now go as a family. He said, we gave birth. My wife gave birth around 26, 27. He said, by the time she gave birth, God said, well, is it not time to go? I told God, wait, wait. Let me raise my children. At least let them be in their teenage years. It's easy for them to understand a different society. He said, by the time I was 50, God came to me again and said, son, are you not going to eat my call? I told God, God, wait. That you know what, God? Let me start a church here. That church will be sponsoring the church in Boko. He started a church. And the church was dwindling, not growing, not growing. Then at 75, he decided. He said, after all these 25 years of doing this, thing, this thing is not moving. He closed the church. He said, oh yeah, God, I will go to Boko. And he came and <laughs> he couldn't now preach. So he was crying. Don't procrastinate. Is there something God has told you to do? A book he told you to write? Is there something he told you to do? He told you to go on Facebook and begin to preach. You know, is, are there souls? Somebody has been telling you, speak to this person about Christ. Don't procrastinate till tomorrow. Now is the time to act. Number four, fear. And this one is a big one. Because a lot of people do not act. Because they are thinking fear. Am I adequate? Can I do it? Uh, maybe what will happen if I fail? What will happen? Saints, one of the things you must understand is that fear is really what it is. F-E-A-R. False evidence appearing real. Acts regardless. The Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear. But of what? Of power. Of what? You know what power is? The ability to change outcomes. God has given us that ability. He says of power, of love, of a sound mind. The wisdom of God is at work in you. You don't know. The Bible calls God the only wise God. If the wisdom of the only wise God is at work in you, that is what you have access to. What are you waiting for? In 2024, Act. And the last one, logic. A lot of people, your problem is that you went to school. Yes. So God is speaking and you begin to convince and show God why this thing cannot work. Logic. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5-7, it says we walk by faith, not by sight. In 2024, don't let anything scare you. Remember what I told you some weeks back? And you know, pastor said it very strongly. Do not limit God in 2024. Do not limit God. And don't settle for less in 2024. Don't let 2024 end and God is saying, this is what overflow meant to me when I was telling you. But this is what you've achieved. I'm telling you. I'm thinking big about 2024, my people. Think big. Don't, no limits. No obstacles. And I round up with this very interesting story. <laughs> Reverend Sam, I did, you told this story and I watched it. I mean, some weeks back, amazingly, 1st of January, it inspired me and blessed me a lot because God was talking to me about some of these things. He said he was learning how to play golf. And... <laughs> He says the person who was teaching him at one particular session was standing by his side. And then the person said, you know, said um, you should hit the ball. And he said he looked ahead of him and saw two trees. So he looked at the person and said, where am I hitting the ball to? <laughs> he said, there are two trees. He said, you know what the person told him? He said, the man looked at him and said, eh. -eh. The person said it in Yoruba, so I would say it. God help me. I'm going into dangerous territory now. So the person said, he said, the person said, eh, she a rigi. 
Do you know what it means? Uh, are you seeing trees? <laughs> so Reverend Sam said he looked at the man and said, yes, now, see those two trees. The man said, don't worry. That you see, there are different, if you know about golf, he said, the edge of the stick that I'm going to, I gave you is the one that is built such that when you hit the ball, it goes above any obstacle and lands on the other side. That's so. The way it works is that the reason why when you hit it, it will go above is when you don't see the trees. Just hit it above. He said, eh, eh. He said, okay. He said, so he hit it. Boom! He said, and the thing went straight into the tree. <laughs> he said, so when he looked at the guy, he said, Shibia, I told you. He said, you know what the man told him? He said, the man said, the tree was in your mind. Ah! In 2024, do not see any obstacle. The resource God has given you would go over any tree and any obstacle. You see, there are some obstacles you will go over. There are some obstacles that you just keep walking. Don't worry. Keep walking. As you keep walking, what will happen is that you will just go through. And you will see that you are on the other side. In 2024, act. And when should you act? Jump on your feet this evening. Act. Go and get that visa. Stop being afraid. Go and get, I'm serious. Go and get that visa. Apply for that contract. I perceive that jobs will come that will look too big. Apply for the job. I'm telling you. Businesses, there is this business God has been talking to you about. Start it. This year, no limits. No boundaries. It is our year of what? The overflow. I'm telling you. Come, somebody celebrate God this evening. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to be taking the communion now. But as we do, I want us to begin to pray. And the prayer is very simple. Lord, help me this year to walk by faith. Help me. Let's pray. Help me this year. The mind of a champion, the mentality of a winner, no limits. No limits, no boundaries. There is this song, no limits, no boundaries. <laughs> no limits. That's the character of 2024. Kill every excuse, kill every fear. Be spiritually minded. No logic would come in my way and stand in my way this year. This year is my year of the overflow. No limits. No boundaries. You know, Paul says it this way. He says, forgetting what is behind. Some people, the enemy of 2024 for you is all the good things that happened to you in 2023. Thank God for those things. But you see, there is more in God. There is more. There is more. There is more. Even if you got promoted in December, there is more. <laughs> Even if your business made massive profits, there is more. No limit means even death is not strong enough to hold you. You will live, not die. That person that has a, you have a heaviness. You've been feeling this heaviness, every pain in your chest. Well, said, the hand of God is touching you right now because there are great things God wants to do with you and through you in 2024. So you are healed in Jesus' name. No limits, no limits, no limits. We get everything that we desire, everything. As we're praying, you can just open your eyes, take the communion very quickly, take it. Take it and we'll pray over it and we'll take it. I mean, just let the communion stewards give it to you. No limits, no limits, no limits, no limits, no limits. Hallelujah. Hello, thank you for watching us. We don't want this to end without giving you an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. You know, um, after listening to God's word like this and you have never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, it's an opportunity to come to him and it's a simple process because he has made all things available. I want to implore you now to give your heart to Christ. 
And by saying these words, because giving your heart to Christ must be done consciously, he has paid the price. Say after me, say, Lord Jesus, I come to you. I believe that you died for me and that you rose again. I believe that you shed your blood for my justification. I accept your finished work right now and I confess that you are the Lord of my life. I believe in you. Thank you, Jesus. If you have said those words, you are actually born again, a new creation in Christ. Join us for more of this. God bless you.